Hey, hey, wait a couple hey weeks. everybody. We're a little late, so we're adding some things. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, it's a great idea. Right. So this is my good friend, Jason Wakefield. He's been pastor of uh, Christ Presbyterian Church Nashua, which was our mother church. And Jason's uh, started a, a um, ministry that's uh, doing things all over the world. So just a couple minutes. I just wanted you to be able to say hi. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and it's great to be here. Alice and I are here worshiping uh, with you this morning. So this is very impromptu. And uh, as, uh, as Steve said, and I'm and really appreciate we're glad to be here. And as Steve has mentioned, um, we're starting something new. Um, we're wanting, uh, Steve's done this in places like uh, uh, Nepal, and we're wanting to do it more full time, which is uh, equip and resource uh, church leaders in developing countries. Uh, so we are doing some support raising. We've been doing it for four months. Actually, some of our support raisers are here today, which is kind of fun. Uh, Ken and Marjorie. And um, we are, yeah, we are excited about this new chapter. It's going to be moving to Denver, uh, being close to our organization, but uh, it's a new chapter. And fortunately, our church our, uh, that's sending us, uh, where I've been serving for 17 years, is doing very well. And uh, we're encouraged by their support uh, through this. So thank you for letting us worship here. And if you'd love to know more about what we're doing, I'd love to be able to share it. So thanks, Steve. Yeah, appreciate you so very much. And I also just want to acknowledge Ken and Marjorie here at Ken's been a ruling elder for many, many years now at uh, at our church in Manchester. It's a thrill to have you here. And Nancy, you want to tell us some good news? Well, I just want to remind everybody that the bottles are due today, but that does not mean that you can't bring them in later, okay? And it also doesn't mean that you can't just donate some money. These, this is for options. Um, remember, that is Crisis Pregnancy Center up in, um, and it deals with family stuff and all that kind of stuff up in uh, Rochester, I believe it is. And this is their fundraising for this year. Um, you can do what I did. I dumped an entire ch change dish bowl that's been sitting there for years. And I realized after I dumped it in that I saw a New Hampshire token. <laughs> And I did not bother to get it out of there. <laughs> I don't See, know what it's worth. worth. That could be worth something. So <laughs> there's a basket in the back there. Just put your bottles in there or put a check in the, the other thing and save for options if you want. Thanks Excellent. so much. Excellent. And just as, as you're coming up, just want to acknowledge that Michael's parents are here today. John Warenda's parents are here today. It's always a thrill to see extended family. Also, it's super to see Kate here to like, what a Father's Day gift, isn't it great? Yeah, yeah it's so great to see Kate. And I think our singing is gonna be up a notch. <laughs> That's right. Which, great, which we're always friendly toward that. So who am I missing? Am I missing somebody else? And, you know, Bruce and Betsy couldn't be here with us today, but, you know, they um, just acknowledged um, that there was it how many years? 56 years plus one week of marriage. So last week when we were talking about you guys, was, you know, 56 years. So thank the Lord. Oh, they may be watching us now from cyberspace. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So anyway. Let's uh, okay. let's get back to normal. With, uh, uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, the Apostle Peter wrote concerning our life here on earth, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Help us, O oh Lord, to always consider our ransom calling. Be with Steve Levitt as he leads us in worship, Steve Rodance as he intercedes for the church, and our pastor to find our significance in that which will last forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Would you please stand with me for our call to worship from Psalm 108, verse 3. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. 
I will sing praises to you among the nations. Our opening hymn is number 249 for the beauty of the earth. Let's turn to the Lord for our prayer of adoration and invocation. Our Heavenly Father, we enter into worship today through the abundance of your steadfast love. We bow our heads in prayer, knowing that you hear our voice. We ask that through this time today that you would lead us in your righteousness, that you would make your way straight before us. In our post-truth world, Heavenly Father, we see the destructiveness of autonomy. Yet we are all image bearers of you. And it's your truth and the hope of the gospel alone that can change hearts and minds. It's your truth and the gospel alone that can cause the rebellious to turn to you, to take refuge in you. We who do take refuge in you rejoice. We sing for joy. We pray that it would ever be that way. May we exalt in you 
as you spread your protection over us. The hope and glory we have in Jesus Christ, your son. You have credited his righteousness to us. And you cover us with favor. You've given to us the shield of faith. So, Father, be glorified in our worship today and forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory be to the Father. be seated. This morning, our consideration of the law of God is looking at the second great commandment. So last week, was it Dave or Doug? Doug, you talked about the first great commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our everything. And in many ways, that's a very internalized thing. You know, for us to, with all that we are, love and honor and adore the Lord our God. The second great commandment is very much an outward expression of the love that we have for God. It's the outcome of it in our lives, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. We first see that in the book of Leviticus chapter 18. And the preceding verses, I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to list for you the things that we are encouraged to do with this culmination of the command, love your neighbor as yourself. So the Lord tells us to share and do good for and with others. Lord tells us not to take things that belong to our neighbors, uh, not to, to deal truthfully, to speak truth to our neighbors, to not make promises that we can't keep, uh, to not oppress our neighbors or rob them of what's due. In a little bit, we're going to be reading from James chapter 2. Um, talking about partiality. So the sin of showing partiality. Don't do it, <laughs> is what is said in, uh, in Leviticus 19. Show uh, righteousness in your judgments. Don't slander. Hmm. Don't stand up against their life. Do not hate them in your heart. Reason frankly with them. Do not take vengeance. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's a couple of uh, places. One of those places is James chapter 2, which I'm not going to read. Um, in the New Testament, Jesus obviously talks about this. Uh, but there's a passage in Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 5 where Paul um, takes on this command. And it's really in a, a section about the freedom that we have in Christ. 
And this is uh, Galatians 5, 13 to 15. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not let your free, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, maybe it's about seven words. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. That's pretty strong words, isn't it? But how easy is it these days to bite and devour? Paul later writes in Philippians 1, 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. But then he'll speak in uh, chapter two of Philippians. Chapter two starts with the word, so. So what? And ultimately in verses three and four, we're instructed to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let, it, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. And I thought about that, that verse four. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of the others. That's almost like Paul is saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? As we think about our own lives and how do we love ourselves? We provide for ourselves. We care for ourselves. We, you know, make money. We, we you know, we mow the lawn. We do things that are, are very much about us. And our instruction in the second great commandment is to love our neighbors in the same way that we love ourselves. Are we always good at that? Probably not. Um, should be our heart's desire. You know, I was thinking about the song we used to sing around the campfire. They'll know we are Christians by our love, right? And, and that's true evidence of who we are when we love our neighbors. Let's read together uh, the confession of sin as it's printed in the bulletin. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their sins. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now hear this declaration of pardon. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father God, we thank you for this local congregation in Exeter that is one small sliver of your worldwide church. Thank you for giving us faithful leadership and sound teaching. You have blessed us so much with your many gifts of teaching, exhortation, hospitality, generosity of time and money, love and concern for one another, and so on. You have protected us so that we may 
worship freely without the worry of physical harm or loss of life. You have blessed us with the leadership that gets along well and has a single focus to bring the gospel and the love of Christ. You have turned us into a freely giving church where we are able to support many types of missions and programs. You gave us a comfortable and reliable building to hold worship services, and we thank you for it. We pray you continue to guide us in future endeavors regarding a potential new building. You constantly outgive us in our attempts to give more for your church. Thank you for building up the body in Exeter. We pray you continue to do so. We lift up our friend and former member, Beth Speed, and her family. Two of Beth's grandchildren are recovering from a very serious car accident. We rejoice in the improvements that they have seen in recent days and pray for a full and complete recovery for both Anna and Timmy. Bless this family with your very near presence, we pray. Lord Jesus, we lift up our friends, Bruce and Bessie Johnson, who are worshiping at home today due to illness and injury yesterday. Heal their bodies and strengthen their souls, we pray. Bring them back to us next week, refreshed in body and spirit. We lift up all of our friends who could not physically make it to worship today. We think of Marianne Rulo, Sharon Souza, Annette Brown, and others. Bless each one with your healing presence and remind them daily that you will never leave nor forsake them. We are thankful for Dennis Fernie's improvement. We lift up, we lift up his decision regarding a further treatment course. We join the Fernies in joyful thanks and hopeful anticipation regarding a potential new home for JB. May your sovereign hand guide this whole process to a good result. Be with Dennis and Sharon and grant them peace. Lift them and strengthen them. Be with JB as he navigates so much change in his life. Grant him the supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding that you promise in your word. We pray for a full and sweeter recovery for Flo Jones, recently diagnosed with COVID. Please also bless Stephen and Nicole Horn who have been ill. Restore them to health and bless this family with your grace and peace. Dead Nicely's friend has suffered a serious stroke and passed away. Please bless the family with your peace and provide for, for her now widowed, widowed husband. We pray for a caregiver for him. We also pray for Deb's sister in Ohio. Please help the family find a permanent way to keep Donna connected to the family. We pray for your continued presence with, for Mary Towser's extended family following the death of her brother-in-law. Please be with her sister Kathy and the family as they mourn his loss. We lift up Lori Murphy and her work with the Shinwari family from Afghanistan. We pray the recent book drive benefits this family as they adjust to life in a totally different culture. We lift up Sharon Baker and her mother, Ann Austin. Please grant Ann continued strength, comfort, a steady appetite, and the necessary and effective treatment by doctors and caregivers. Bless Joel and, and Sharon with your peace, comfort, and stand, stand, stamina as they seek a facility nearby for Ann. May you be glorified through the love and service in this family. And Lord, we thank you for Nancy Camp and her work with Trail Life and American Heritage Girls programs. We are thankful that you have moved to provide board members for both groups. We pray for this ministry and the children we will be serving. We join Nancy in praising God for the children among us and these precious ministries that endeavor to show them Christ's love at an early age. We rejoice with Romanian Christian enterprises that you are working through them to bless Ukrainian refugees who continue to come and find help and safe haven from the storm of war. Please bless this vital ministry as they act as the hands and feet of Christ. Bless them with the increased financial support they require to meet rising operation, operational costs. We thank you in advance for supplying all of their needs. We thank you for the recent live stream of the Gospel Coalition, Gospel Coalition Women's Conference. May you continue to bless the women of this church and others with joy through the spirit and word via ministries like these. We lift up the 603 Gospel Challenge as they set up the Great Commission outreach teams all over the state of New Hampshire. Executive Director Dick Kernan requests that we join him in prayer for this ministry and says, unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. We pray you will go before us, Lord, prepare and lead the way for this essential ministry. May they be humble to be used for revival in New Hampshire. 
Joanna and Palmer Robertson request prayer for Palmer's work in leading four Sudanese elders and their pastor through some teaching on the covenants and other doctrines. We pray that you ground them in truth and anoint them with your spirit in order to grow in grace and draw others into the faith. And Lord God, we pray for a Middle East Reform Fellowship and their work in Ethiopia, Sudan, and Jordan. Bless these saints who endeavor to spread your word in areas that are often hostile to the faith. Protect and keep those converts who face very real consequences for accepting Christ. We pray for your word to spread like wildfire throughout these areas and beyond. Living God, help us to hear your holy word so that we may truly understand that understanding we may believe and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Be with our pastor and let his words be your words. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to turn to Exodus 36, and I'm just thinking about it. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. I just have to admit before you that sometimes I have fallen into pride about um, the missions giving of the church here. And I just want to testify before you all that this had nothing to do with me. And really, this is all God's, this is all God's work that's just frankly a gigantic surprise to all of us. In fact, there, almost anything good that's ever happened in this church, that it just all is in a lot of ways a gigantic surprise to us. So I, I just want to be clear about that and somehow to make that clear. So we're just free to, and you know, the way to God doing whatever he wants to with us and not having this other thing be a blockage that can happen. Okay, so yeah, I'm not going to read from the hymnal. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so Exodus 36, Exodus 36, uh, this amazing work, we were, already, we were already into it at the end of 35, but now 36, and, the, and it's the building of the tabernacle. Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him freewill offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came each from the task that he was doing and said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the material that they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. And all the craftsmen among the workmen made the tabernacle with 10 curtains they were made of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns with cherubim, it's like angels, skillfully worked. Uh, the length of each curtain was 28 cubits and the breadth of each curtain, four cubits. All the curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains to one another and the other five curtains he coupled to one another. He made loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain of the first set. Likewise, he made them on the edge of the outermost curtain of the second set. He made 50 loops on the one curtain. He made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was in the second set. The loops were opposite one another and he made 50 clasps of gold and coupled the curtains one to the other with clasps. So the tabernacle was a single hole. He also made curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits and the breadth of each curtain, four cubits. The 11 curtains by themselves uh, I'm sorry, the 11 curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And he made 50 loops on the edge of the outermost curtain of the one set and 50 loops on the edge of the other co uh, connecting curtain. And he made 50 clasps of bronze to couple the tent together that it might be a single hole. And he made for the tent a covering of 
tanned ram skins and goat skins. Then he made the upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. 10 cubits was the length of a frame and a cubit and a half, the breadth of each frame. Each frame had two tenons for fitting together. He did this for all the frames of the tabernacle. The frames for the tabernacle, he made thus 20 frames for the south side, and he made 40 bases of silver under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. For the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, he made 20 frames, and there are 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame and two bases under the next frame. For the rear of the tabernacle westward, he made six frames. He made two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear, and they were separate beneath, but joined at the top at the first ring. He made two of them this way for the two corners. There were eight frames with their bases of silver, 16 bases under every frame, two bases. He made bars of acacia wood, five for the frames on the one side of the tabernacle and five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle and five bars for the frames of the tabernacle at the rear westward. And he made the middle bar to run from end to end halfway up the frames. And he overlaid the frames with gold and made their rings of gold for holders for the bars and overlaid the bars with gold. He made the veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen with cherubim skillfully worked into it, he made it. And, and for it, he made four pillars of acacia and overlaid them with gold. Their hooks were of gold and he cast for them four bases of silver. He also made a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework and its five pillars with their hooks. He overlaid their capitals and their fillets were of gold but uh, but uh, their five bases were of bronze. So you could easily get lost in all that details there, right? And maybe some of you builders and things, you can envision things a little better than I can. But there's, there's three uh, big images that are used throughout the scriptures for the church, at least three. One is this tabernacle temple idea, you know? So that's one. The other is the body where we have, you know, Christ the head of the body, and then we're the body of Christ. The third one is the idea of a husband and the bride. You know, all of them are talking about the same thing, though. So whether it's the tabernacle here or the bride we're going to be looking at in 1 Corinthians, it's all the same thing. It's our connection with Christ, who is, you know, the cornerstone of the temple, and, and he's the husband of the bride, the head of, of the body. So let's go on now into our gospel reading, and it's Matthew 17, and we're looking here at verses 22 and 23, and what we realize, you know, taking this imagery of the temple, remember the idea, the stone that the builders rejected would be what? The cornerstone, right? So you can't have any temple without that cornerstone, and he's talking about the death and resurrection of Christ. So here it is, two verses from Matthew's gospel. The second time that he now, Jesus now uh, helps people to understand this laying of the cornerstone here. And as they were gathered in, ga gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed right okay and then the our last reading uh from uh the new testament before we get to our reading of the morning is james chapter two a little bit more here today it all i think holds together and steve referred to it as well and this morning so james two one through 13 and this is, this is the idea, really, of saying, let's see that temple move forward. Let's actually move forward in holiness and godliness. Amen. Wouldn't that be good for us? That's like the best thing we can do for evangelistic discipleship is to ourselves take seriously what's said here. We're not supposed to be just partial to one group or another or something like that. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, if you pay attention to the one 
who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom, but he has promised, which he has promised to those who, who, who love him, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but falls, fails rather in one point has become accountable for all of it. Just take that in for a second. What bad news that actually is for us. You fall in one place, you just broke the law of God. How are you going to get out of that mess, right? For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, which, by the way, that's quite a trick to not do that, given what we know about the command from Jesus. So if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I don't know about you, but I want to hear more about that mercy. Don't you? Right? Because we're all sunk. If it's just strict justice and it's based on us rather than a substitute, we're going to have to have some mercy. Will you stand now? As we hear the Apostle Paul, he's been talking here in 1 Corinthians 7 throughout the chapter, both before this passage and after these, this passage. He's been talking about singleness and marriage and all of the issues, divorce and all these practical issues. And now right here, he tries to, he brings in some other illustrations, but we still have ringing in our ears, singleness and marriage as we should. But he just goes on to some other issues here. Okay, here we go. Only, this is 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 24. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Meaning, were they Jewish? All right. And they had the sign of Judaism, let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. So to try and not be Jewish anymore. Don't try and do that. He said, was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised, a Gentile, in other words, let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bond servant, slave, when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant, a slave, is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant, a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Please be seated. Oh, brothers and sisters, so many things on our hearts and so many times we're thinking through the providence of God in our lives. And we have a better plan than God, wouldn't you say? Yeah. We think the real problem is X, Y, and Z. And we're full of shoulda, coulda, wouldas. My New Jersey is coming out there. But that, that we've got a world full of that. Should have, could have, would have. 
And then everything would be great if only it was that, except it's not true. And we find ourselves, honestly, many, many times overcome with stress, overcome with it, even when we seem to be happy and we are genuinely happy. I mean, when I'm with you, I'm happy. That doesn't mean that I'm not overcome by stress later or before all of that. And I don't think it's just me. We're, we're overcome by stress about a lot of different things. What do we do? Is there an answer for this? Or is this all just sort of a lot of religious talk and then you go away and none of it actually is connected to practical life? Well, one thing I think we can say from 1 Corinthians 7, it's connected to practical life. I mean, some of the issues that he's addressing in 1 Corinthians 7 about singleness and marriage, you think, wow, I'm really surprised he talked about that. I had so many people praying for my preaching of 1 Corinthians 7. You know, everybody I talk to, they say, well, what would you like me to pray for? Well, I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians 7. Just pray for that. And, and we've gone through about half of these messages so far, and you've received them well. And I'm, I'm thinking once again, that's an answer to prayer. That's an answer to prayer that you'd be able to take all that in. And in fact, it's gone so well that I think to myself, well, what was I exactly worried about here? But no, it's the Lord. All right. And, and so now he, he has something central to say in the midst of all, all that about singleness and marriage. He's got something central to say, which is very much counter the way we think about things, because we think if I could just change this little thing in my life, then everything would be great. And we don't think to ourselves, yeah, I just I, maybe I should just stay as I am in some way. And that maybe I, maybe some of these other things are not the key to my happiness of life. Right. We're always thinking about something else that would make us happy. Right. And here, what is he saying to the church in Corinth? Well, I think two things. Very simple, really even though there's a lot of illustrations. The first and largest point is this, live the life that the Lord has assigned to you. Wow. At first you could sort of, uh, that just took the wind right out of my sails. I'm tr trying to do everything I can to not live the life that the Lord has assigned to me. <laughs> Give me something else. Is there anything else you could assign later? <laughs> now I'll take a new assignment, <laughs> right? The, and and sometimes there are new assignments. So that's the first thing. And then we'll say, only uh, do not continue in, in sin. And I think he's saying this to the Corinthians. And basically, the Corinthians had a lot of things that they wanted to change maybe in their life. So, because what happens is you receive this message of grace and mercy through Christ. And you're thinking, well, it's, this is all, all about change. So I want to start changing everything. I want to change. And there's part of that that's right. Everything does change. But it doesn't mean that the outward specifics of some, uh, you know, of, how, of who we are are going to change. You know, I'm st I still have the same parents, right? I mean, happy Father's Day, Dad. I'm thankful for him. Great guy. There's nothing I could do to change who my dad is. I don't want to really, but there's nothing I could do to change that, even if I wanted to. And there's no, you know, becoming a follower of Christ did not all of a sudden give me the license to ignore the fact that I was the son of Bill McGee. Right? That was just part of who I am. And God, who is sovereign over all things, he made me to be, and you, who you and I are. He's planned that all out. And instead of thinking, if I could just throw off some of these other things, and I'm sure the Corinthians wanted to do that, you know, especially sin, right? Wouldn't you just like to... Uh, just, could I write out uh, a couple of years here? As if the rest of the years are just fine. And I had no problem. It's not true, right? But he's knitted all together, even though he's not the author of sin. Like he knit it together for these Corinthians. And he made it just what it was supposed to be. So that each of them in the church in Corinth was right where God wanted them wanted them to be when they heard this word and this letter came to him so i think we have to take that to heart but here first them your life he's saying to the corinthians 
is not a random accident, but the purposeful gift of the God who loves you. And sometimes it's just, it's hard to take because there are certain parts we could say, okay, I can say that about a lot of things in my life, but here's this one part. And you know what? I understand that. I'm not trying to change on that point, particularly today. All right. A lot of things we just, look, I placed my hand over my mouth. I don't need to comment on everything, right? I don't know the answers to all these. Maybe you could talk to him about it. And, you know, he'll, he, he'll know what to do next on some of those points, right? Okay, see, where are you right now? He's saying to the Corinthians, are you Jewish? Are you Gentile? Um, you know, we're so privileged to have the horns in our congregation. I mean, Stephen Horn, he is a Jew of Jews. Yeah, and, right. and he used to be in a congregation at 10th Presbyterian Church. And every time that Dr. Boyce preached, and anytime you see in a commentary of Dr. Boyce where he says, my Jewish friend says, that's Stephen Horn. And he's in our, our congregation, you know, and he's a serious Jew. We're so blessed. Yeah. I think of Michael Green, who yep. was one of the first people that we baptized in the church. He, he was a Jew. He's a non-practicing Jew. Stephen Horn was a serious practicing Jew. They both found Christ. Christ found them. And then there's uh, all these Gentiles, right, that have been brought in. Fantastic. And, and you know, it's very easy. You could think back in that Corinthian day and that time. You, there would be a lot of Gentiles in that Corinthian church saying, I would like to be a super Jew like so-and-so right? I wish I was Stephen Horn, right? Wait, maybe I can become, I could become circumcised. And then I'll have this mark of Judaism. And that will, and maybe I'll just keep a few festivals, you know, do that. Wouldn't that be great? I'll be Jewish. And Paul's saying, mm, you're kidding yourself. What about, what about the ones who are Jewish who say, you know, that I, that was part of the old covenant. And now we move on and, you know, circumcision, that was the mark of entry into the old covenant. And now we have a new mark of entry and baptism. And you know what? Uh, with being Jewish has a lot of baggage. I would like to leave my bags here. Yeah. Is there something that can be done where I just be considered a Gentile? And Paul is here saying to that Corinthian person, please don't kid yourself. You don't need to not be Jewish. <clears throat> not be gentile you don't need that okay what else this one's a shock what about being a slave he says he says these words which i would never say but it's in the bible he said i can say it don't be concerned especially i think today do you know what today is this is june 19th for a lot of people they're thinking about that day is that that mark an important idea of Okay, that's gone, which we, you know, we're so thankful that the scourge of American slavery, which oh, with all of the stuff that was just so bad biblically, that's, that's, that's gone. The, tr the trouble is it's not entire. See, the thing is the slavery and bondage all over the place. A lot of people are stuck in bondage of some kind. And it was true in, in Corinth too. So he says, don't be concerned. What kind of message, Paul, do you have for the Corinthians where you could speak to a slave who's getting this message and say, don't be concerned about that? That must be something really good. That's what I think. It must be something so good to overrule that of being actually a slave. And it, it said, now he goes on. I'm glad he does that. He says, if you can gain your freedom do so. So he doesn't want anybody to think, oh, no, this is great. I'll just stay a slave when the, you know, the master is there and he's saying, look, I'm just convicted of this, that this would be the best thing for the kingdom. And I want to give you freedom. Think of, think of uh, Philemon, right? That little letter, right? And Paul asks Onesimus, he said, he said, by the way, I'm asking you to free, <laughs> you know, Onesimus. So, yeah, uh, so I may have gotten the names wrong, but you, you get the idea. Anyway, free the, free the man. And he says, I, I'm confident you will. And by the way, make a room for me because I'm coming to see you soon. And by the way, you owe your own life 
to me. So please do pay attention. <laughs> so yeah, he wanted him to free. He, had, he actually instructed him to do that. So he's saying to the pe people in Corinth, look, can you get your freedom? By, oh, by all means, please do. And that's true of a lot of things in life. Same with poor and rich. Look, can you improve your economic situation in such a way that you can actually care for yourself and for others? Please don't think, oh, no, no, I'm poor. Paul said, just stay poor. No, that's not really what he means. It's just, are you banking your hope on being Jewish or Gentile, on being uh, no longer a slave or being married or single, you know? And you think that's where my whole life is and that's what I want. No, he says, look, take the slavery as an example. And he says this wonderful stuff that enables us to think about life in a different way. He's not saying just ignore the things in your life. It's just you say, oh, who cares, slave or not slave? Who cares? Well, we do care. We actually care about that. So what, what do you do? Well, you, here's what you do. You process it through the story that makes all the difference for us. Okay, you're a you're slave? Uh, you, no, you're not. You're a freed man. <laughs> Just let that sink into your head every morning when you wake up. I'm free in Jesus Christ. Oh, what about the other side? Okay, you're free? Hey, no, you're not. You're a slave of Jesus. You've chosen that. You know, because why? Because he's chosen you. He, you know, we love because he first loved us. It's a privilege to be a slave of Jesus. We just... We're just rejecting it often. So somehow he processes it all through the big story of Christ and his kingdom. And so the general principle that we're seeing here and extend it again to the singleness, right? And married stuff, because if we think about it in our day and age, think about the things that we care about so much. And we think, I just want to take off this one thing of who I am. And you no, he's telling us, in whatever condition you were called, remain there with God. Yes, there will be opportunities to change. Obviously, there are a lot of single people that are going to eventually be married. The whole church is single, and we're on our way to being married. He's not saying, well, reject that idea of your marriage to the Messiah. <laughs> no, that's the furthest thing from his mind. We're all moving towards a marriage coming down out of heaven from God, this bride, right? That's where we're moving. It's just that in our lives, some of us might not experience the marriage that we might even want to have, might not happen for us. And he's, I think, would love, he's saying, look, don't let that be the first issue, you Corinthians, don't. I understand. Now, Paul was a single man, right? And yeah, he felt he was called to be single. A lot of people are single. They don't feel they're called to be single. And so it's hard. There's a lot of hard things in our life. I just finished reading a book about the boys in Sudan that did the walking, you know, through Sudan as the war was going everywhere. And they made their way into Ethiopia and beyond. And eventually a lot of people to America. And I know a lot of them thought, you know, my life will come together if I'm an American. How many orphans in Romania thought that too? If I could be an American, my whole life would come together. You know what the evidence is for us? No, it's not actually true. Now you might be able to have it and may God use it if he gives you that opportunity, you know, but there's a lot of sadness in this broken world. We take it seriously. We mourn with those who mourn. And the Corinthians, I hope they would have known yet. You know, here's Paul. He is understanding the misery of this world. Some of you today, particularly on a day like today that has a name like today's day has, it's not an easy day for you. It could be a super hard day for you when you wish someone was there, was not that all of that right you know what i'm talking about right and yet we're able to say somehow we sing it and maybe our hearts can believe it whatever my god ordains is right and i think that that's what the apostle paul is saying to corinth but here's second point much more brief only do not 
continue in sin. He's telling them general rule is continuing is all right, whatever it is that you're in, except for this one thing. Don't continue in sin. We get that from verse 19. He, he says, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, which is quite a shock. You know, so whether you're Jew or Gentile, that doesn't count for anything anymore. But keeping the commandments of God. Now, here's the thing. This is apparently the critical issue, keeping the commandments of God. He says in another place, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters, matters for anything but truth working itself out through love. I think those two are the same thing. Keeping the commandments of God is also truth working itself out through love. But here's the thing. Apparently this is of critical importance, but we don't do so well at it. So I'm wondering, how is this good news? If we say, oh no, none of those other things matter, but keeping the commandments of God, and you think, well, now how's that supposed to help me? How do I somehow, how am I okay if keeping the commandments of God is the main thing? Because I was listening to Stephen Levitt today how about how we're to love our neighbor as ourself. I was convicted. I was able to say the confession of sin there. I, please tell me there's something more. Of course, Steve, he did tell us there is something more. There is hope for us. That was very clear. And I want to be just as clear. Yes, obedience to God's reveal will, uh, reveal will matters. But there's good news for us here. I think we can get there right now. Let's consider as we move to our main point and then our application. Consider this. Jesus, he was circumcised. He's Jewish, right? But he's the savior of Jews and Gentiles. He came to serve. Yeah, he, was, he came like to be a slave. He came to serve, but he lives forever as the king of a resurrection kingdom. So he's the source of freedom for everybody. He was a faithful single man, right? And, and he had this just, what the apostle Paul really would have said, what, what a way to go. He doesn't have to think about anything else. He can just be single-minded as a single person can in terms of serving God. That's what Jesus did. But he's, he was on his way to being the husband of a holy bride forever. So the centerpiece of his life was not his Jewishness, was not the fact that he was a servant or, or free, or the fact that he was single or on his way to being, you know, being married as a betrothed person. No, the centerpiece of his life was his gospel mission and his obedience, even to the point of death on the cross. So he went forward with that, you know, there was joy and glory, and everything good was set before him, and the pathway was through the miserable, horrible death of the cross, and he went there when he, cut, he had legions of angels where he could have overturned. See, think of coulda, shoulda, woulda. He's right there, and he could. And there's some ways you can do it. He should have. And maybe you think, but what, what, will he? Would he? No, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't because he knew it shouldn't be. And, and so he couldn't do that. Thank you. Thank you, God, for what you have done for us. See, this is the way we turn this into good news. Here's the thing. And honestly, even though, you know, we know the gospel, good news, right? But a lot of people miss this point, that the obedience of Jesus is the absolute crown jewel of the gospel. If you don't have his perfect obedience to the law, then the law has not been satisfied, right? So you're still left there. Say, oh, this is nice. God showed me mercy. Well, what's the content of that mercy? Because no one's actually satisfied for me all the holy demands of God. And I have this gigantic debt. This man died for my sins, whatever in the world that means. But I, I'm still left with, uh, well, there's a balance that's still owed. And I don't have the money for it. Does anybody have any heavenly coin? Because I don't have it. Right? But he did. He had all of it. 
and he paid that balance in full. Much more than that, he took his holy obedience, that crown jewel of his life and death for us and his resurrection. He took that holy obedience. He deposited that in the account of his bride. And so yeah, you're, you're just looking through the mail and said, oh, flyer, throw this one out. Wait, I already got, uh, I got something from the bank already. But, you know, just uh, we do electronic banking here. What's this notice? Better open it up. This has been a surprise deposit. You have beyond billions in your spiritual account. A man came into the bank and he did that for you. Um, by the way, he wants to talk to you because he's got some thoughts about where we go from here. And I think that's right. See, we take that, we look at that holy obedience and then we, we have Jesus's holy obedience. And then we have, say, okay, yeah, live the life that, that the Lord has assigned you, but do not continue in sin. Okay. Are we seeing it now? It's all over the Bible. It's in Exodus 36 about, about Bezalel and others using the gifts that they have. It's in James 2 and loving your neighbor as yourself. It's in Matthew 17 that we read where Jesus knew that he was headed someplace that was going to be costly. It's there first about Jesus, and then it spreads out. It's such big good news that it cannot be contained in a tiny little piece of Tupperware. It has to actually overflow from the small bit of our hearts, and it goes out then through your church and, and through your family and through wherever you are, everything, you have, it's going out beyond the borders of whatever it is that we try and keep it all trapped up in. And it, all of a sudden now there's something happening and it's way bigger than anything we know about. So the point is we must not look for our significance Oh, don't yell, Steve. <laughs> yes, yell. We must not look for our significance in matters of temporary identity. We all do this, all of us. But in that which la will last forever, let that be really what fills our heart. We have good news and the perfect obedience of Jesus for us. And that's the only thing that allows us to have contentment. And you know what? Godliness with contentment is great gain. I think it's, it, that's in the Bible. Okay. So two brief applications. Here, here we go. What is God saying to us in these verses? First, we're too easily moved by the temporary. It just happens to all of us. And it's part of the, it's part of the bipolar life. We embrace that. We embrace that here. All right. So, yeah. It, is it possible that we've been obsessing about some matter that is actually not what our lives are all about? Yeah, that is possible. Secondly, the most important things in our eternal existence are already settled. You do not have to think, well, yeah, I hope this is true. And then later, you know, we'll figure, we'll find out now. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an absolute exclamation point in all history, which says, look, this actually worked. It's one thing to have a theory that your death is going to work atonement for people. It's another to rise from the dead by the power of an indestructible life. That's what's happened. And that's what gives us this great assurance. So, so in light of the word of the cross, shall we not obey? and live in the freedom of the sons of God. Are you struggling with life? Why in the world would we ever think that our answer to that would, would be no? We're here in a world that's it's falling apart. I'm not talking about the last news cycle or something. I'm talking about since Genesis 3. This world is falling apart. And the more we study history, we think, oh, I guess it's not so bad right now. I mean, it is, but it's been bad a long time, right? It's been bad. All right. So, so now let's do this. Let's put our trust in him. Trust and obey. 
There's no other way to be happy in Jesus, right? Than to do what? Oh, now you're committed. <laughs> See what happens when you know these songs? <laughs> Father, thank you very much for this opportunity to be together here in your presence. And Lord, it's, it's just good to know that unless you build the house, those who build it labor in vain. This is all for your glory and your kingdom. We give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, very good. Let's, uh, let's sing perfect hymn 233. Oh, Father, you are sovereign. Let's stand. Father, you are sovereign through all the world you made. Was spoken and light and life obey. Your voice commands the season and bounds the ocean shore. Sets within their courses and stills the tempest roar. Oh, Father, you are sovereign in all affairs of man. No powers of death or darkness can thwart your perfect plan. All chance and change, transcending, supreme in time and space. You hold your trusting children, secure in your embrace. Oh, Father, you are sovereign, the Lord of you. Transmuting earthly sorrows to gold of heavenly gain. All evil overruling has none but for good. Your love pursues its purpose, our souls eternal. Father, you are sovereign. We see you dimly now, but soon before your triumph, first every knee shall bow. With this glad hope before us, our faith springs up. Our sovereign Lord and Savior, we trust and worship you. Amen. Nicene Creed together. You ready? Here we go. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead whose kingdom. And we believe in the Holy Spirit 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We come to the Lord's table again. I want to read to you 57 through 61 in Matthew 27. And it says this, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. So that's the whole of the picture there. We're going to look at a little bit more of that in the weeks to come, but just as we would celebrate the Lord's Supper here today, I just say, there's nothing that seems more final and more depressing than a grave it really is just the idea of having somebody in the grave. Now there's two really important exceptions to this. One was a, a fellow named uh, Lazarus because it turned out of four days that here comes uh, somebody and he says, Lazarus come out and he came out. But then much more than that was this particular grave, which ended up being borrowed. You don't usually think of a borrowed grave, you know, or say, you know, you don't rent it. It's that you need that, except for this place, which fill, you know, fulfills Isaiah 53 with the rich man at his death. And then, you know, he has risen is the next. And that's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And what that means, it's not just Lazarus's grave and Jesus's grave, but now every grave has this possibility here before us of saying, okay, this, though it looked final, is not. There's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. I think the only thing that really matters right now for all of us is, so, look, where do you stand in terms of Jesus Christ? That, that's the whole thing. That's all of it. And if you've been admitted to the table here or elsewhere, and, uh, and you believe in, in Jesus, and you're, you're following him, then come and partake with us here, right? And don't be so quick to uh, exclude yourself, by the way, because a lot of people, you know, they, they, they feel like uh, spiritually, they have a sour stomach of some kind, and they better not put anything in their mouth. Let, let me tell you, don't excommunicate yourself. If you need to be excommunicated, Come and see us. So far, we haven't, we haven't done that. We talk about it all the time. I'm almost embarrassed. We haven't done that. It's interesting. I was down in downtown Exeter once. A person came up to me. She was convinced she was excommunicated. I said, no, you, you weren't. Now, now she's just one of our most faithful you know, followers of the Lord. <laughs> she is. But that's just what God does, right? So let's see what he does, right? And let's take that bread and that cup and let's partake of that. But if you've never come to the Lord and profess your faith, don't you think you should? This is probably not a surprise. I think you should. <laughs> I think you should. And come and see me and so or somebody else. There's, there's, there's tons of people here that can help you with that. And why should we live our lives without hope in Christ? We have, we have every reason for a good hope. Let's pray. Father, we pray, take these elements now and let them be used for your purposes here today. And help us to have resurrection hope today in Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
I wonder if you knew that we in uh, Presbyterian Church in America that that we have a college. Did you know we have a college? <laughs> Some of you know, and they have a, a hymn that that that's the college song. I think I'm saying that right. All for Jesus. All for Jesus. All my beings ransomed powers. All my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. I think that fits in with what was said last week and today about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Let my hands perform his bidding. Let my feet run in his ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth his praise. Worldlings prize their gems of beauty, cling to gilded toys of dust, boast of wealth and fame and pleasure. Only Jesus will I trust. Since my eyes were fixed on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. How do we sing words like this? Because it feels like I haven't lost sight of everything, but we're straining forward to something better. Yeah, I've lost sight of all beside, so enchained my spirit's vision looking at the crucified. Oh, what wonder, how amazing, Jesus, glorious King of Kings, deigns to call me his beloved, lets me rest beneath his wings. That's the thought I want to leave to you with you today as we're preparing to partake of the Lord's table, that the one who serves you here, it's not me. I don't serve here. It's not the elders. It, it's not even yourself. You know, we have a serve yourself little communion here. But we have a priest. You're probably really surprised that we Presbyterians have a priest. We have this great high priest. In fact, it's not enough for us to have a priest. We have a high priest. And he is serving us from heaven. He's the one who's really saying, this is my body. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And beyond that, we try not to say too much. Because every time we say too much, we get ourselves in trouble. So Christ is present with us in some way that's awfully hard for us to fathom and to describe. And so we have the sign and seal of the new covenant. This is great. This is so good. Isn't this a good day? It's a good day. Whatever else we could say, the challenges we face, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what wonder, how amazing. Jesus, glorious King of Kings, deigns to call me his beloved. Let's me sit beneath his wings. Right. You're covered. You're covered. Yeah.
So forget about my voice, his voice. Take, eat, this is my body. Thank you, Father, for the bread. It stands for the body of your son. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we have a credible alternative to the grave, resurrection of your son. We thank you for the cup that stands for the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of sins that's ours and the good work of the Holy Spirit that we seek in every way and every day for your good glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. Oh, Father, what a good day you've granted to us. Father, we thank you that whatever else we can say that may be going on right or wrong in our lives, there's something that's very good, very right, because of what your son has done, his obedience and his death. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand now and sing a cappella, um, the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. M502, all for Jesus. Let's just recommit ourselves as we sing today. All for Jesus. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my beings ransom powers all my thoughts and words and doings all my days and all my hours let my hands perform his bidding let my feet run in his ways let my eyes see Jesus only, let my lips speak forth his praise. Worldlings prize their gems of beauty, cling to gilded toys of dust. Boast of wealth and fame and pleasure, only Jesus, I trust. Since my eyes were fixed on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So in chain my spirit's vision, looking at the crucifixion. Oh, what wonder, how amazing, Jesus, glorious King of kings, deigns to call me his beloved, lets me rest beneath his wings. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord 
cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever. And all God's children said, Amen.